This evening we're going to start, as I have already told you, in Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at one of the probably most quoted verses in the book of Galatians, and it's verse 20 of this chapter, Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20, and we're going to be entitling this series that we're going to be looking from this one verse uh, on the general subject of crucified with Christ, crucified with Christ, and this message tonight and the subject for this message uh, beyond that theme of this uh, series is I am crucified with Christ. A simple subject, I am crucified with Christ. And let me, let's read verse 20 uh, of Galatians chapter 2 and then we'll get started uh, into the introduction for this message. As I uh, started the book of Acts this morning and uh, had a lot of information uh, Leading up to the very first verse, we're going to read the verse, our key verse tonight, verse 20. And of course, that'll be our key verse for every message that we're going to look at. We'll just have different subjects and titles of, of sermons that we'll preach to you. But uh, I've got another long introduction, but I'm hoping that God will give you some inspiration through these words that we have for you tonight. The Bible says in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified, Paul said, with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now it's been said, and I've heard this uh, in, in my Christian life, in ministry, I have heard people uh, who are saved by the grace of God. They know that their sins are forgiven. They know that they're saved. But they are living a life of frustration. They are living a life of failure and faithlessness as a Christian. They are, they are like many who I've heard who say, Preacher, I'm enduring the Christian life rather than enjoying the Christian life. And you might say, well, why would a person make that type of statement I believe the key is our text verse, verse number 20 of Galatians 2. They've not learned that they've been crucified with Christ. And so I'm hoping that through this message that we uh, can learn to be overcomers rather than being overcome by the enemy. I may, I, let me just put it to you like this way. I want to live the victorious Christian life. How about you, church? I want to live for the Lord. I, I, want to, I want to experience the joy of the Lord. I want to have that Christian life that's, that, that's full of joy and peace and contentment. I know we got, I know we got conflict. I know we got battles. But uh, enjoying the blessings of God and the consolation of God and knowing that it, it's, it's not about me, it's about the Lord. And Paul learned that. And as he's giving this, this verse of Scripture, and we'll give the uh, prelude to all of that in just a moment, but when you think about living that life of frustration and failure and faithlessness, uh, when you do that, you're living total discouragement. And there's a lot of saints of God in 2020 that lived in discouragement. There's a lot of saints of God already in 2021. They're saying if 2020 is as bad as it is, then I'm just going to be totally discouraged in 2021. Well, friend, let me say again to you, you don't have to be overcome by the enemy, but thank God, according to the Word of God, we can be overcomers. We can be more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus Christ. I say this to you in your Christian life. You better get a hold of this, and I want you to forget this. I want you to write it down on the table of your heart, on the page of your Bible somewhere. There, there's some empty pages in the front and the back, and I always wrote a lot of notes down that my pastor would say. But I want to say this. God never intended for us to live the defeated Christian life. He intended and His plan was for us to live the victorious, overcoming Christian life. And so when you think about that, he, I put it like this. He wants us to live that spirit-filled, that satisfied fully, serving faithfully Christian life. And it's lived in him and by him. I was reading about some statistics that were taken of a study on people who exit the church. In other words, who leave the church. And I know it's an old study. It's about 20 years old. But he, there was a study done by an individual by the name of David Barrett. And David Barrett, or you could say Barrett, 
uh, pronounce his name that way. But this man who was uh, a writer of a certain magazine, a Christian magazine, did a study from uh, the early 1900s until the year 2000. And here's what his uh, statistics showed and proved. After a long period of time, he said over 53,000 people leave the church every week never to return again. You think about that. You say, preacher, that's, that's unreal. That's staggering. I wrote down his name, wrote down the magazine and everything that it was taken from. And I want to tell you what, that is staggering. That is alarming. That over 53,000 people would walk away from the church, walk away from God, never to return again. Now I say to you here, listen, we don't have to live that kind of life. If you're truly saved, hey, listen, you can live that victorious Christian life. We've had some who have been a part of this church that you know what has happened to them? Somewhere along the way, they was trying to live in the energy of the flesh. I don't know what the problem was. Maybe they weren't fully submitted to God or whether they had other problems. But you know what? They wound up getting put by the wayside, walking away from the things of God. And friend, I don't want us to do that. I want you to, listen to me, I want you to be victorious. I want you to be a, an overcomer in your Christian life. And you say, well, preacher, I'll just be honest with you. I know I've got this in my notes later on. But, but you say, preacher, I just can't live the Christian life. Hallelujah. I'm glad you figured that out. Huh. You know what? You can't live the Christian life. I don't know how many times I've heard people. I, I was talking to an individual last week, and they said, Preacher, and I was talking about how God had supplied back in uh, some lean days in our life and how that God just supplied some things for us as a family and, and how God worked things out to help us pay bills and even buy Christmas and all those things. And I said, You know, God, God, God never has supplied like that in that certain way and ever again. And that individual looked and said, I just wish I had the faith you do, Preacher. I wish I had the faith you do. Well, it's not about the faith that I got. It's the faith uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ gives each and every one of us. See, I don't, I, don't live this, I don't live this life. You don't live this Christian life by your feelings. But we live by faith in Him. That's what Paul's telling us right here in this verse. And we'll see it. I think what we need to do in our lives is uh, as far as the remnant, this faithful remnant, and thank God for you that are here tonight and we're worshiping God and we're looking at God's word. I want to tell you what, hey, listen, when the church realizes their need of God and realizes that we need a real heaven-sent revival, uh, when we humble ourselves, as the, as the man of God said in the Old Testament, when we humble ourselves and pray and seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, then we'll hear from heaven. Then he'll forgive our sin. And heal our land. And both God will restore us, God will revive us, and God will help you. But you're going to have to get on your knees before God. So when you think about this thought, uh, as God uh, deals with us through this, and as Paul has given us this, this thought here uh, concerning uh, being crucified with Christ, as I said, oh, we're not to be victims, but we're to be victors. I want to, I want to call your attention to Romans uh, chapter 8 just for a moment. You may turn there. You've got time to turn there. Romans chapter 8. And several verses of scripture concerning that, that how we're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Paul said that in the book of Romans, that great doctrinal book. He said, man, you, you've got victory uh, in Jesus Christ. You, you've got victory not only in him, but through him and by him. Hallelujah. We can have victory in our soul. I like what he said in chapter 8 of Romans, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What a question. Shall tribulation, distress, persecution... Famine, or nakedness, peril, or even sword. He said, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. But nay, no, in all these things, listen, he said, we are more than conquerors through who? Him. Him. Jesus. We're more than conquerors through him. Through him that loved us. It's not through the church. Not through, although the church is a good one, it's not through the preacher, although I'm still here, amen. I'm not going to say I'm a good one, but I, I'm a preacher. Not through the preacher, not through the Sunday school or the Sunday school class. Hey, it's through him, him that loved us. Notice here in verse 38 and 39. He said, I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 
even height or depth, verse 39, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're not to be victims, church, but we're to be victors in Jesus Christ. And so when we think about this, I, I was thinking about the verse in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, uh, the, the need for the hour, the need for us as saints of God is that we return back uh, to the center of our gospel, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory, according to Colossians 1, 27. And so when we look at this thought, look at it, Galatians 2 and verse 20, he said, I am crucified with Christ, being in him, I say this here, without him we're nothing. Without him we're defeated. Without him, hey listen, we can do nothing. He said in John chapter 15 verse 5, let me give you this. He said, I am the vine. And he said, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. As I say again, as I said a few moments ago, preacher, I can't live the Christian life. You can't. But Christ can live it through you. And as we sing, we sing that song around here, that little chorus sometimes, and we're going we're gonna to sing it before long. It's no longer I that liveth, taken from Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. He lives, he lives, Jesus is alive in me. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. When you think about this thought concerning this Christian life and living the Christian life, the Christian life is nothing more, as somebody said, than the outliving of the indwelling Christ that is in you. Thank God. As I said, hey, listen, as a church collectively and Christians individually, we need to continue with this thing. It's all about Him. It's not about us. As I said this morning, it's all about Him. F.B. Meyer, let me give you this. F.B. Meyer was an old Baptist preacher. F.B. Meyer lived and he was born uh, in 18, I think it was 1847. And he only lived to 1929. I believe that's before any of us were ever born. 1929, he died. But he was a Baptist preacher in England. And you think about this. Here's what he said about this verse, Galatians 2.20. He said, this is Paul's confession of the power of the cross in his own life. It stood between him and the past. His self-life was nailed there. And this new life was no longer derived from vain efforts to keep the law, but from the indwelling and overflowing of the life of Christ. And that's exactly what Galatians 2.20 is all about. It's the, hey, listen, it's the indwelling of Christ that lives in me and lives through me that helps me live this Christian life. And I want to tell you what, that's the only way you can live it is Jesus Christ living through you. Now let's look at something. The setting of this verse, Galatians 2.20, I'll read it to you again. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What's the context of this verse? I like to take things in context. You say, well, preacher, what do you do by that? You go back to the beginning verses that precede this one verse and you find out what was happening. Let's get the background, the foundation. We'll look at the substance, which is the content of this verse, and the stimulation, which is the challenge of this verse later on. But let's get an introduction tonight. Let's look at the setting of this verse. The, 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 the communication, how that those who came together, uh, the, they talked about the communication among the committee, as I call them. And we're going to see the, the circumcision of the Christians and then the confrontation of these companions. But let's look at it in that order under the context or the setting of this verse 20. The church at Jerusalem, it was filled with a lot of Jewish believers. And all those Jewish believers, there was a lot of those Jewish believers at that time, especially the book of Galatians here. Paul's uh, coming up with verse number 20 and leading up to verse number 20. He, he's facing those Jewish believers. And there was a lot of those Jewish believers who were still holding on uh, to uh, Judaism, Judaism, as they call it. In other words, holding Christ, but also wanting the law too, maintaining the law. If you remember in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us there's better things in Christ than in the law. And uh, there's better things in the Lord than in the law. And you say, well, preacher, what's wrong with the law? Nothing wrong with the law. 
But when Christ came on the scene, Matthew chapter 5 tells us that when Christ came, he said, I've not come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill it. If you got the Lord, you don't need the law because he is the law. Amen. And it's all wrapped up in him. And so when you think about the context of this verse, these Judaizers, they were, they were telling the church and all those uh, believers, they were saying that you all have to uh, continue under the Mosaic law. But as I said, Christ came to fulfill it, not to destroy it. So Paul goes back to this church and he has a meeting with them. Here's the, here's the, the, the committee meeting and he comes together. At the end of this service tonight, we're going to have a little bit of a business meeting. So he comes back and he meets with all of them. Go back to verse number 2 of Galatians 2. Paul was willing to admit that he said, if I'm wrong, I want you to correct me about this. But he said, we got a problem here. He said, I'm preaching Christ crucified and living that crucified life. And he said, he said there's some conflict going on. So let's go back and look at it. Verse 2, here's the meeting. Communication with this committee as he calls them. He said, I went up by revelation. And communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. In other words, what he's saying is, I, 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 I went back there to Jerusalem to that church. I talked with those individuals and said, this is what I'm preaching. In other words, what are you guys preaching? But this is my message. And so he says, I go back there. The Bible said, but privately to them. He went privately to those which were of the reputation, those Jewish leaders. He said, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Now you say, well, what is he trying to say to him? Is he going back there wanting to change his message? No, he's not wanting to change his message. He just wants to make sure that they understand they're all on the same page. You see, when you get saved by grace through faith, friend, nothing else, nothing more. It's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the what, church? Life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Listen, if, if you've got to have the law and keep the law to be saved, friend, you're doomed. The law was never, never meant for us to keep it, but the law was there to show us our need for the Lord. Amen. Does that make sense? And so he goes back to him. He said, I don't want to run in vain. I don't want to preach in vain. I'm coming back here. Let's hold a committee meeting. Let's get together. And uh, we can identify that in the Baptist church, ain't we? Can't we? Uh, he said, let's get together. Let's talk. Let's see what's going on here. He said, because I don't want to do anything in vain. Now notice the circumcision of the Christians. He, he brings up the fact in verse number 3. He said, I've come here. He said, I'm with Barnabas and with Titus. And he said, I'm here to, uh, to de declare the freedom from the law of Moses. We got, we're free from the law of Moses. We, we're under the Lord now. He said, but neither Titus. He said, along with Barnabas, he was with him as well. He said, who was with me? Now, Titus, being a Greek, he said, was, com uh, was compelled uh, to be circumcised. He said, you didn't compel Titus to get circumcised. Now, let me, let me give you an explanation of that. Those Jewish believers who were under Jude, Judaism uh, as they were following the Mosaic law, they said, if you get saved, you've got to get circumcised. Now, they were talking about the physical circumcision, the cutting away of the flesh. But see, when Jesus came, he said, I'm not going to destroy the law. He said, I'm going to fulfill it. When you got saved, it had, it had nothing to do with your flesh. It had everything to do with your spirit. And the circumcision uh, of the Spirit of God is that which cuts you, the sinner, away from Satan, away from sin, unto the Savior. That's the circumcision of the saint of God. But now they were saying, oh, no, we need to be circumcised physically. Well, Paul said, I had this, this Greek with me. <laughs> and he, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't a Jew, but he's a Greek. But you didn't compel him to be circumcised. And you've been fellowshipping with Titus. You've been running right along with us. He said, now what's the problem, man? He said, let's don't run both sides of the fence. Let's get this thing settled. Make sure that we're on the same page. See, Titus had been saved by grace through faith in Christ but without any thought of keeping the law of Moses. He said, I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. As I say again, I say it over and over again throughout this message. It's not the law you need, it's the Lord you need. It's the Lord you need. And so there was the, the circumcision among the saints. They, they were talking about that. Uh, they had that, that meeting saying, man, what, what page are we on uh, in our message? We've got to make sure we're preaching the message. Now here in verse 11, go to verse 11. There's a bit of a confrontation. We're going to give this to you. I want you to get this. Now some saints of God like this. <laughs> they just get excited about confrontation. Have you ever met some people just like to just have confrontation? 
You like some people just like to fuss and fight about everything? They want to argue. You go outside and you say, boy, the sky sure is pretty and blue. They say, no, it's gray. You ever had anybody like that? Come on now. So here, here, here they are. And there's a confrontation that happens. Well, let's read it. The Bible said, but when Peter was come to Antioch, the Bible said, and this is Paul speaking, he said, I withstood him to the what, people? Face. Do you see that? Verse 11. Is that right? He said, I withstood him to the what? Face. Because he was to be blamed. Now, what was he to be blamed for? I'll give you that in just a moment. But now here's the Apostle Peter. He's preached on the day of Pentecost. I mean, thousands have gotten saved. And boy, he's out there preaching. And Paul said, now I'm giving a message to the Gentiles. He said, uh, we got to get together. We got to make sure we're on the same page now. And, and, and there's some things that happened up in Antioch and, 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 and in ministry. And so Paul, when he hooks up, he gets up in front of the Apostle Peter. The Bible said they got face to face. <laughs> they got nose to nose. Now you say, well, preacher. Was that really a confrontation? They was just discussing some things. It sure was a confrontation. Now you say, well, preacher, was that Christ-like? I'm not going to talk about whether it's Christ-like or not, but Paul said, we've got to get something straight. I'm preaching the crucified life. I'm preaching the crucified Christ. And here you are taking people back to the law, so we've got, we got to get something settled now. And so there's a little confrontation. The Bible said he withstood him. To the, and you go back to verse number 9, uh, that, that where Barnabas and Paul, they had already received the right hand of fellowship from those there. They had been shaking hands with them and fellowshipping with them. And everything had been hunky-dory. Everything had been going good. And then Simon Peter shows up. Now, I'm going to give you something concerning that in just a moment. The Bible said he withstood him face to face, right to the face. This means, uh, I, I like, this means, I, th- I look at it like they were nose to nose. Boy, they done got up close to one another. Now, they couldn't do that in this corona day. They'd have to get their distance, wouldn't they? They'd have to have their mask on. But they got up face to face, the Bible said. And what prompted this holy indignation was the deceitfulness and also the compromise that was demonstrated by the Apostle Peter. You go back in Antioch, Peter had fellowship with non-Jewish Christians. Now, think about this now. You go back and read there in the book of Acts, and we, we may even cover some of that. But back there, uh, the Apostle Peter, he had been fellowshipping with those non-Jewish Christians. What I mean, those that were not circumcised. And then everything, it was public matter. Everything was going good. They was having good fellowship. But all of a sudden, James shows up in the crowd too. He's the first Baptist preacher, James is, of Jerusalem. Now James, if you know, we studied through the book of James. James never minced any words. He is a tough individual. I mean, he called it out. When he called it out, he called it out by name. And boy, he wasn't afraid of all this. But when James shows up, Simon Peter, you'll find out in just a moment. We'll read the scripts. He backs up. He says, oh, I can't fellowship with them people no more because James showed up. It's like us preachers sometimes getting, getting together and, and, and we, we, we get together and then we fellowship. And then if this other preacher comes in who's of great influence, we say, oh, we better not fellowship with that group anymore. We can't fellowship with them. We'll go fellowship with these others. Paul said, we got a problem here. Simon, he said, Peter, we got a problem. He said, if, you can, if it's all right for you to fellowship with them on Tuesday, it ought, it ought to be all right for you to fellowship with them on Sunday. Somebody help me now. Now, there's a lot of things we could preach here. We're preaching about the crucified life, but we could, we could preach about uh, this thing of compromise and this thing uh, of, of, of showing favoritism and non-favoritism and worried about prestige and, and popularity and all that stuff. But we're not going to get into all that. But listen, if it's all right to fellowship on Tuesday, it's all right to fellowship on Thursday and Sunday and other days, right? And so he said, I got face to face with Peter, and I said, hey, now look. He said, you know who you've been fellowshipping with. You know who you've been talking with. And said, but when James showed up and all that stuff, you, you withdrew yourself. You said, well, preacher, does the Bible tell us that? Yeah, let's look in the Bible. Let's just see what God's word. So they show up there, and uh, it seems that uh, while Peter and Paul and James and all of them, uh, and let me say this to you. Let me say this to you, lest you get confused here. I don't want you to be confused. They weren't competing one with another. They were to complement one another. And they were still preaching Jesus. Repentance unto salvation, faith in Jesus Christ. They were still preaching the message. But, but, but you, can't, you can't go back and, listen, I don't want you to try to go back and tie me up to, to grandma and grandpa's tradition to run the church. I want to know what God's word has to say. Are you with me? 
And so Paul was trying to teach them. He, he, he was kind of telling old Simon Peter, he said, what you're really doing, he said, you're dodging the Christian uh, crucified life. That's what you're dodging. Let, let me give you something. Let me go back. Matthew chapter 16. You remember Matthew chapter 16? You don't have to turn there, but you remember Matthew 16? I'm going to read you a couple of verses here in a few moments. But this wasn't the first time that Simon Peter was rebuked. It wasn't the first time Simon Peter got jumped on. If you remember back in, in Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus was with the disciples and he said, Whom do men say that I am? You remember that? Matthew 16. And they said, well, well, Simon Peter, he jumped up. He said, Boy, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Don't you remember that? And Jesus commended him for that. He complimented him for that. And he said, Boy, you are. Uh, he, said, he said, Boy, who told you this? He said, Flesh and blood didn't reveal this. He said, But the Lord did. My heavenly father did. He said, you're on track. I am. I am he. I am the son of the living God. And of course, he talked about, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail it against it. You remember that verse there? Well, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, when Jesus had told him, he said, he said a little bit after that, in that conversation in Matthew 16, Jesus told him there, and he's standing there now. And he said, fellas, I'm going to be, live, be delivered. To the chief priests and, the, and those uh, who are going to who are going to take me, the elders, chief priests, they're going to take me and crucify me. He told them that in Matthew 16. He said they're going to crucify me. I'm going to be at the hands of those uh, elders and chief priests. They're going to crucify me. I'm going to be buried, but I'll rise again the third day. Now, when that happened, right after he had said, Simon Peter just told him, said, Thou art the Christ. The son of the living God. In Matthew chapter 16, in verse number 23, here's how Jesus rebuked him because back in verse 22, here's what Simon Peter said. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now he's just got through saying you're the son of God. And then, then now the Lord tells him, said, I got to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'll rise again third day, but I'm going to be crucified. Simon Peter looked at him and said, not so, Lord. That's not going to happen. Well, Jesus rebuked him. He tells him, he said in verse number 23, he turned, he said unto Peter, now get this now, boy, this is a strange verse in the Bible. But boy, I tell you, it shed, shed some light on some things. He looked right at Simon Peter, and here's what he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, if the Lord looked at us, and, and he said, hey, you get behind me, Satan. He didn't call out your name. He didn't call him Simon Barjona. He didn't call him the apostle Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, see, what was happening was, and I, I do believe this, I believe that Satan had kind of got in between that mix there and influenced Peter to say, Lord, you ain't going to the cross. Well, that's what Jesus came for was to die. And some uh, Bible scholars do believe that that was probably why uh, that, 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 uh, that prompted him to deny the Lord. And the Lord said later on, you're going to deny me three times. You remember that? He said, probably this instance may have, may have brought that on with, with the Apostle Peter, Simon Peter, for him to deny the Lord because, man, he allowed himself to get caught up in the flesh. You know, now, Simon Peter was a tough individual. He took a sword and he tried to cut that man's head off, but that fella dodged him and he got his ear, did he not? That's in the Bible. And now here the Lord's rebuking the Apostle Peter, and he's, he's rebuking him. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He said, thou art an offense to me. For thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus added, and here's what it is. Here's the kicker that goes back to Galatians 2.20. Here's what he said. He said in verse 24 of Matthew 16, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his what, church? Cross. Take up the cross and follow me. It's all about the cross, not circumcision. And see, they would say, they were teaching that. They were saying, oh, you still got to go into the Mosaic Law. You got to be circumcised to follow us. And Paul said, no, you don't. I got Titus with me. None of you has talked to him about that because he's saved by grace, by faith that he placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm glad. Hallelujah. I don't, I'm not under the law. Are you hearing me? I'm under the Lord. Now, does that mean that I can go out and steal and cheat and kill? No. That's not what you do. In the Lord, they don't want to do none of that. In the Lord, I don't want to live wrong. In the Lord, I just want to live right and follow Him. Come on, help me now. In the Lord, I just want to serve Him. In the Lord, I just want to have joy. I don't have to worry about breaking the law. I don't desire to break the law. Now, some of you, I know what you said in your mind. Preacher, 
When you drive up the road, how fast are you going to go? I'm not going to answer that. As I said, this probably led to Peter's denial, could have been. Let me give you this thought here. You know the message of the cross is not what many want to hear. The message of the cross is not what many want to hear. You see, we adore the preciousness of the cradle. We just got through with Christmas. Oh, the cradle, look at it. We adore the preciousness of the cradle. We await the promise of his coming. But nobody, hey, listen, we abhor and nobody wants the pain of the cross. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. You're going to have to deny yourself. And so we see the setting of this, of this verse. Why was verse 20 there? Let me give you the substance, the content of this verse, the very fabric and the fact of this verse. I believe verse 16 tells us that we're justified by faith. We're justified in faith. We're justified through faith. He said, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the what? Law. We're not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. It's faith in Him. For by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It's a gift of what? God. Even when we believed in Jesus Christ, He said, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So what's the substance of this whole thing? The setting, we've seen it. The context. But look at the content of it. He said we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul makes it clear that a person cannot be justified by the works of the law. But he says by the word of the Lord. I like what the book of Romans tells us there. In Romans 10, 17, he said, So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the what? The word. The word of God. Hallelujah. And so when we think about the crucified life, I am crucified with Christ. Look at verse 17 quickly. He said, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. In other words, nothing can be added by justification, by, in, and through faith. Nothing can be. It's Christ alone, Christ alone. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We're in Christ, and we're going to find that in this verse 20 when we get into it as we study week by week that we're, we're crucified with Him in death. We're crucified with Him in life, and we live and let Him live through us. Verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Once we receive Christ, what a sin it would be to try to go back and do the works of the law. As I just quoted Ephesians 2.8, it's the Lord and Him alone. Verse 19, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Paul said, friend, hey, we don't have to go back and be circumcised. Thank God I was circumcised when I got saved. You say, what are you talking about? The circumcision of the heart. By the Spirit. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. Hey, listen, I'm glad, I'm glad we don't have to go back and kill no turtle doves and, and, and present no sacrifices. I'm glad we don't have to do any of that. Hallelujah. Once for all, Jesus died for us. You say, how can I live that Christian life? Through him as he lives through us. So when we think about that, the law, it reveals our need for the Lord. Christ died for us so we might live for him. Uh, when we think about this, and let me say this to you now before I go to the last thing, verse 20 we'll, we'll hit. The stimulation or the challenge of all this. Our liberty in the Lord, and I've said this to you before, but get this. I want you to get it. Our liberty in the Lord is not a license for us to sin. When I said a few moments ago, and I made the statement very rapidly, but I, I live for the Lord. And the reason I don't steal, cheat, and the reason I don't do things and uh, all those things as far as commandments were concerned, it, the reason I live for the Lord is because of the Lord. My liberty in Christ doesn't give me a right to go out and do wrong. My preacher used to put it like this. He said, uh, when, when you think about God's grace, he said, God's grace is not a clean glove for a dirty hand. It's not a clean glove. For a dirty hand. In other words, you don't take the grace of God and, and, and the cleanness of the grace of God and you put it on a dirty hand. He said, that's not what it's for. It's to try to cover up it. So your, your, your liberty in Christ does not give you a license to sin. You see, a lot of people think, think that. They say, boy, you, you're saved. You're saved forever, right. Well, then I can go out and do what I want to. No, you can't. 
Your liberty in Christ doesn't give you a license to sin. See? And so he says here is the challenge. Here's the stimulation of all this. I'll read to you again. Galatians 2 and verse 20, and we'll close. Look at it. He said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. As I said at the beginning of this message, you can't live a Christian life without Jesus. And what we're going to find in this one verse, as we study this verse over the next few weeks, what we're going to find is that it's Christ, as Paul said, living in me. Living in you. You see, when I've tried to live the Christian life, I've failed. I've not only failed, but I've become frustrated. And my faith, uh, faithfulness turned into faithlessness. And I, I wasn't able to make it. I was a failure every time I've tried to live, every time I've tried to live in the energies of flesh, thinking that I had some kind of goodness about me. Hey, listen, I always fail. Same with you. But when we realize that Christ lives in us, I'm free tonight. Are you saved? If you're saved by the grace of God, you're free. You got liberty. <laughs> and you say, well, wait a minute. You said I didn't have liberty to sin. No, you don't have liberty to sin, but you got liberty to serve the Savior. You got liberty to tell this world that Jesus saved. You got liberty to just keep on worshiping, keep on reading, keep on praying, and keep on looking toward the eastern sky. Hallelujah. You got liberty in Him because Christ lives in us. So when we receive the Lord, everything changes in our life. Hallelujah. Everything changes. We become a new creature. When Christ died on the cross, think about this. When Christ died on the cross, all the demands of the law were satisfied in Him, in Him. When we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, this verse tells us that when He died, are you hearing me now? Listen to this. When He died, you're going to find this out as we get deeper in this. When He died, you died. When he died, you died. Hey, listen, you was buried with him, and you rose again with him. You say, preacher, what do you mean by that? Let me just illustrate it this, and we'll close. When a person gets saved by the grace of God, and they know they're saved, they follow the Lord in believer's baptism. You remember that? Now, when we get in that baptistry, and I baptize somebody that says they've been saved by the grace of God, and they want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And I say this to you, a person who, ever get, who gets saved and they know they're saved by the grace of God and they never follow the Lord in believer's baptism, that person's going to struggle the rest of their life, spiritually speaking. And you say, preacher, why do you say that? Because I've seen every, every person I've ever known that, 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 that said they got saved but never was willing to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, they struggled in, in their spiritual life. They did. But what do we say? Upon your profession of faith, and in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I now baptize thee, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And said, buried with him in death, raised up in a newness of life. That is exactly a relation to Galatians 2.20. When you got saved, you was crucified with him. When hey, you're buried with him and you rose again with him. Hallelujah. Hey, listen to me. It's not I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. Stop trying to live the Christian life and just start trusting in the one who lives inside of you. God said you got all power, Ephesians 3.20, and that power that now abideth in you. You see, the reason we're struggling, the reason we're not being victors and we're being victims the reason we're being overcome rather than being overcomers is because we just keep trying to live this Christian life and not letting Christ live it through us.